Okay, so we are going to continue where we left off yesterday, which is that we had got to the point where we were considering loop-oriented optimizations. Now, loops, otherwise known as for loops or while loops, are a very common occurrence in most signal processing algorithms or in general in most compute intensive algorithms. Because if you look at even high performance computing and the kind of problems involved over there, they are typically trying to do computations involving either vectors or matrices. And for the most part, what you are trying to do is iterate over the one dimension of the matrix, multiply with something, accumulate, do some kind of computation, maybe do a matrix inversion, whatever it is, all of those the kind of linear algebra problems or even the convolutions that you find in neural networks, all of them end up being some kind of matrix operations which ultimately get implemented as loops. So most of the time what you will find is that the highly compute intensive parts of signal processing as well as high performance computing algorithms end up being some kind of loops, for loops being the most common one. Okay? So it's worth spending some time trying to understand the kind of optimizations that can be done on those kind of uh, loops. So without going, we'll be going into detail on each one of these later. So before that, I want to just talk about why loops are important. And in particular, what is it that we are trying to optimize when we say that, you know, you're going to optimize the loop in a certain way. The biggest problem with a loop is the fact that there is a certain overhead associated with the loop itself, right? So when I write something like, for i is equal to 0, i less than 100, i plus plus, and do sum is equal to sum plus i, right? The addition, the actual work being done inside the loop is very small. It's just one addition. But in order to do that, if we are considering software, then effectively what we'll have is there will be one step which involves initializing the counter which is a one-time operation, that's okay. We don't want to count that as overhead. But on every run through the loop, there will be an increment or decrement. In this case, increment. We are going to add one to i. We are going to test a condition. Is i less than 100 or not? And depending on that, we will branch. Okay. So typically, there for every run through this loop, you have to execute at least four instructions in software. Right? Whereas the actual work being done is only one instruction, add, sum plus i. Okay? So it is very likely that if the main work being done inside the loop is relatively small, then the loop might become inefficient simply because of the overhead associated with it. Another thing that happens, especially in software, is the fact that if you are accessing memory locations, then how you access those memory locations becomes very important because computers, processors, nowadays especially because of the fact that the DRAM, the external memory is much slower than how the processor itself works. The processor then has to have some kind of a caching memory which can respond very fast but has a low capacity. So how does the cache work? How does it pull data into the cache so that the next access is done faster? That has a big effect on how loops work. Now from the hardware point of view, Similar considerations because what happens is how do you implement a for loop in hardware? You will have some kind of a finite state machine and a counter. Okay, So there will be one step for initialization, one state for initialization. Then as you are going through the loop, there will be some kind of a conditional checking and some muxing. The muxing basically involves either the data that needs to be computed has to be sent to the appropriate compute unit or we might have to switch state to get out of the loop and go to the next state. Okay. And if you have some kind of read and write operations inside the loop, there will be extra cycles required for doing that as well. Those also have to be accounted for. So in other words, you can see that there, because this is, so this goes back to our original thing. This is a common case. For loops are very common in most kinds of programs or most kinds of algorithms that you're trying to implement, whether it be hardware or software. So it's worth spending time understanding and trying to optimize them. So let's look at a few of the optimizations that can be done. One of them involves optimizations with regard to the induction variable. Now, what is an induction variable? In this case, i. Okay. In other words, the loop index is the one that we call the induction variable. This j is a computation that involves the induction variable, right? And if you look at what is happening over here, 
every time that I run through the for loop, j is equal to 4 into i plus 3 needs to be computed. Now, 4 into i may not be a big deal, right? Because after all, I can do it by shifting or by multiplication. It doesn't really matter. The point is there are two computations involved. There's a multiplication and there's an addition. So almost certainly two clock cycles are going to get spent for doing that every time inside the loop. Okay, That is in addition to the loop overhead, which involves incrementing the counter, checking the condition, etc. Okay, And finally, I have a function call y is equal to f of j. Now, if it turns out, well, if it was just y is equal to f of j, then you know, you might argue that there is some dead code elimination, etc. that could be done. You know, I'm not considering those kind of special cases. We'll assume that y is something else. Maybe it's a pointer, it's something is getting updated or it's y of i, which is getting updated in this way, right? So f of j, if it is not a very big computation, the j is equal to four into i plus three might itself become significant compared to the work. What can we do here? How can we reduce this work? Not have the, that multiplication and addition inside the loop. Exactly, right? See, after all, what are you doing with i? i is running n times. It's going from 0 to n minus 1. But the only thing it's being used for is one, to keep count of how many times you have gone through the loop. And secondly, to compute some value of j, which can then be used in order to do some work. Why not just straight away compute j? Okay, how do I do that? Let's look at when i is equal to 0, what's the value of j? Right, so I would rewrite this for loop as something like this. For j is equal to, when i is 0, what should j be? 3. Okay, so I initialize it to 3. What's the condition I need to check for j less than? 4 into n plus 3. Now keep in mind, 4 into n plus 3 will be taken out by the compiler, constant folding. Okay, So it can be computed ahead of time. It need not be done inside the loop. Okay, So there is still only one initialization step. <coughs> the problem is, now it's not j plus plus. What should I do? j equal to j plus 4. Okay, and straight away I can have y is equal to f of j. Now what has this done? Anyway I had to do an increment on i and a comparison on i as part of the loop. Then I was computing j after that. Instead I straight, straight away made j the induction variable and changed how much it gets incremented each time it goes through the loop. And as a result of that I have basically reduced a couple of cycles over there. Okay, now the important point is this this might look like a very minor optimization, right? But assume that this was a nested for loop, one for loop sitting inside another. The outer for loop runs 10,000 times, the inner for loop runs 10,000 times. The savings can be enormous, okay? So don't underestimate the effect of getting small savings like this. Having said that, this is a classic case for what you need to be careful about premature optimization, right? Because the savings that you get by doing something of this sort are relatively small. You should be looking to see what are the big improvements that you can get first. And this kind of thing, usually either the compiler can take care of, or it's that final tweaking, the last stage to get that extra 5%, 10% performance. Sir? Yeah. Like, uh, so say, say inside the loop, if we are declaring a variable, there can be, like say, I'm declaring inside uh, integer A and yeah. outside integer so will the for compiler automatically take it uh, outside the loop? Take? If you are declaring, so inside the for loop, so what you have is there is a for loop and I declare int a is equal to some constant, right? And then you are using a inside over here. Yes, the compiler can take it out, assuming that it can actually, what it will do is it will do an analysis of the loop and see whether the value of a is changing. If it's not, it can be moved outside the loop. Right? So in fact, one of the things that the compiler needs to do is, whenever you declare a variable in general, what happens in the C programming language is, there has to be some memory space allocated for it. Okay, So some area of the memory, one location, if it's an int, then one 32-bit location will be allocated for that variable. But if the compiler, when it does the analysis, it also does something called a life, lifetime analysis. 
right and finds out okay when did the variable first come into existence when is it last used if that is basically within a small block like this the compiler can do an additional optimization and say i will not even declare a memory location for it i will just keep it in a register use it and dispose of it once i'm out of the loop okay so this in other words the fact that you have declared a variable over here does not guarantee that memory will be allocated for it or that you know how will the compiler actually implement it finally in the software execution if you want it to be a memory location then you basically will have to do something like either declaring it as a global variable or something to ensure that memory gets allocated for it or of course so one other thing which i forgot to mention yesterday but is important what you will notice is that even in vivado hls and also generally speaking when you are writing c code there are different compilation options that you can use okay so with the gcc compiler for example if you give the default it does not try to do much optimization okay that is controlled by the minus o flag which is given as one of the parameters to the gcc command if you give minus o 0 essentially it does almost no optimizations minus o 1 will do some very basic optimizations minus o 2 will do more significantly more optimizations and minus o 3 will actually do fairly aggressive optimizations including potentially things that can give you wrong results okay because it makes certain assumptions on things like how many times a loop is going to run what kind of your whether you have done array bounds checking whether you need to check the whether you are reading outside of an array and so on right so depending on the level of optimization that you give tell the compiler to do it will apply more and more of these techniques by default it will not so if you declare int a over here it will actually create a memory location for it and do everything but if it's trying to optimize it will just make it a register all right loop fission and loop fusion are two related transforms that you can perform on loops right what does this mean essentially what this is saying is i have a loop which inside the loop i am doing two computations okay a of i is equal to a of i plus 10 and b of i is equal to b of i into 7 can you think of any reason why this might be a problem or why this is not the most efficient way of doing things it relates to what i had mentioned about the fact that you have memory and you have cache and then the cpu okay so the cpu talks to memory through the cache what does the cache memory do any time that you access one particular element it pulls in that element first from main memory into cache and then from the cache to the cpu and you do some computation in this case so what you are going to do is any time that you access a of 0 it will pull in the value a of 0 do some computation with it and write it back into a of 0 it goes back into the cache when i access a of 1 a of 1 gets pulled in from memory i do something with it and write it back into the cache now there is something called locality of reference which people observed from large amounts of code that were written which basically said that very often what happens is if i access location number 0 i am probably also going to access location 1 2 3 etc okay so the way that the cache works is usually that rather than reading in an individual memory location i will read in a block and try and get this in here all at once okay so i will end up with a so called cache line which will contain a0 a1 a2 and a3 say it might contain more but at the very least it will probably contain at least some four elements or eight elements some small number like that okay it doesn't make sense to pull in like 1k elements because very unlikely that you will be reading in that many at one shot and the overhead involved is too high but what the cache is saying is look you are accessing a of 0 chances are you also want to access a of 1 after that so it pulls it in and does some computation with it But the problem with this loop is I'm accessing a of zero. In the next clock cycle, I'm hitting b of zero. Not uh, in the next step inside the same for loop, I'm hitting b of zero. Okay, there is a possibility that both of them 
right so this is a this is b both end up clashing on the same cache line why does that happen because of the way caches are implemented they don't always guarantee that different memory locations will go to different cache locations you could have a cache conflict over here if this happens performance will be really terrible because what will happen is i will access a of 0 it will pull the whole a line into cache then i access b of 0 it throws the entire a line out pulls in b next iteration through the loop again it has to throw b out and get a then again throw a out get b okay performance can become quite bad this is of course an extreme case but it's a possibility what can you do if you look at these two instructions there's no dependency between them so i can easily write this as for a and another for loop that goes for b okay now what happens i do all the computations involving a first optimal use of the cache everything is perfect it runs fast then i switch over to b run all the computations involving b guaranteed that there are no cache conflicts over here <coughs> the problem is there is some extra overhead due to the for loops right so it's a trade off you need to sort of look at the actual implementation and decide whether or not this loop fission which was applied over here fission basically means splitting the fission that we did over here was it worthwhile okay what about fusion now look at this and this they both relate to a a of i okay so i could potentially have combined both of them a of i equals something and c of i equals a of i something this is good because at least a is being accessed twice there is a slight possibility that c also ends up you know conflicting with the same cache location but chances of that are less if that happens then then you know you have other problems to deal with at least you don't need to read in any other data and more importantly whatever you computed for a of i can immediately be reused out here you might even be able to do some kind of constant folding propagation etc and reduce some computation not even have to do one extra read from memory okay so this is a case where loop fusion can be used the advantages of fusion are two one is if there is a related data then the cache you don't need to have two hits to the memory the cache will take care of it better the second thing of course is you are reducing loop loop overhead right because every time you go through the loop you have that increment compare jump which can be shared across two sets of instructions so remember uh, all of these things are the cases where it's not always obvious that it's going to give you a benefit so the compiler has to take a call whether or not it's a good idea in general c compilers don't do this kind of fission fusion kind of transformations easily they do it only when you have aggressive optimizations in place right this is one of those places where human intervention actually can make a big difference right so this is one of the kind of things where even when you are writing the code you can actually look at it and say okay if i split the loop does it open up any options for me to do further optimizations later on loop reversal is an interesting uh, again transformation right again related to the cache in some way all that it's saying is if i have i is equal to n down to 0 right if i had the memory and let's say that this was a0 a1 a2 a3 etc the as far as cache is concerned this might all be one cache block right but what i might do is because i read a3 first it pulls in some data corresponding to a3 right next time around it goes to a2 it pulls in some other data corresponding to a2 they may not correspond properly to the same cache locations okay so it is possible that by reversing this make it i is equal to 0 i less than or i is equal to 1 i less than equal to n i plus plus 
right and do this you get the same behavior but the way that memory is accessed changes and can potentially improve it's not guaranteed once again okay but you have to be very careful this and this look like they are doing the same uh, function because after all if i look at what the for loop is going through it is exactly the same in both cases but the net result of doing this will be completely different in the two cases in the first case <coughs> a of i gets a value from a of i minus 1 so in other words a of n will get the value for, for a of n minus 1 a of n minus 1 will get the value for, from a, n minus 2 and so on this will basically become a shift register what will the second one become what happens to a of 1 it gets the value of a of 0 what does a of 2 get the same a of 0 right so a of 0 gets copied everywhere right so this is an example where it looks as though the transformation is valid but it is actually fundamentally changing the behavior of the program so you can't just it's not just a question of looking at the index variable and changing things around loop interchange once again related mostly to the problem of caching right what happens over here is supposing you have a nested for loop and a two dimensional array the first question to ask is how is a two dimensional array stored in memory okay so supposing i have a over here right and it has rows 0 1 2 up to some let's say 9 and this also has 0 1 up to 9 so it's a 10 cross 10 matrix right how will this get stored in memory it actually turns out that that depends on the programming language that you are using right because there's no fundamental thing saying that this is how you need to store a array in memory right and furthermore it turns out that c and fortran use different techniques for storing it they are called row major and column major approaches so row major essentially says i will store the entire row first i'll take a 0 0 then a 0 1 a 0 2 up to a 0 9 right these are increasing memory addresses then will come a 1 0 a 1 2 uh, sorry a 1 1 a 1 2 etc okay this is row major axis instead if i went by column i would say a00 is the first one but after that would be a10 a20 etc finally i would go to a01 then a11 a12 etc this is so called column major format what's the difference again related to caching because caches will always pull out blocks based on increasing memory addresses right so if you had it in row major format then it makes sense for you to access the data in the row major format right access them one by one in that case now let's look at this loop what's happening over here you are going j is equal to 1 to m that's the outer loop and the inner loop is i equal to 1 to n but what you are seeing is x is equal to a of 2 j okay so every time that i go through the loop right the for the, in the for loop that i have over here for the for i loop right i will first access a 20 then a21 then a22 and so on uh, sorry this was actually a bad example i think uh,
yeah I need to uh, split this around effectively what would happen is supposing I had something like this for i is equal to 1 to n for j is equal to 1 to m and some function of uh, or rather I try to access the memory location a of i and some constant okay what will happen over here is I will first access a of 1 2 then a 2 2 right what I would like to do if I am writing a C program would be a 1 2 a 1 3 a 1 4 a 1 5 those would be consecutive memory locations but a 1 2 a 2 2 a 3 2 are not consecutive memory locations right so what happens if I switch the loop around and make it for j is equal to 1 to m for i is equal to 1 to n mm. well no actually this will still not solve the problem I will end up basically with a strided axis right Right. So, uh, what does strided access mean? It basically means that I am going to access location this one, then this one, then this one and so on. Whereas, I would like to access them in consecutive order. If I cannot access them in consecutive order, at least once I read them, I should use them through the entire inner loop before I go on to the next one. Okay. So, if I can at least switch the values of i and j around, switch the order of the loops i and j, what will happen is, I will when I do this, I will read a of i2, right? Uh, sorry, this is again a bad example. I should have picked this carefully. Yeah, sorry. So actually what happens is this is the even worse example, right? this one is better why because at least I am running through the entire for j loop every time that I do one read of a i2 so I do several computations before I read the next value of i I can't get around the strided axis but at least every time I read a value I do several computations with it before I move on to the next one whereas over here a changes on every iteration Okay. So, the order in which you write the loops can make a difference. Once again, is that valid? Are you allowed to switch the order of the loops around? That is something that you need to take care of. It is not always the case. Similarly, you might also have a situation where you have these nested for loops and you are trying to access some A of ij. That is the entire, it is the matrix itself that you are trying to access, all the elements. Okay. Once again, the order in which you are trying to do it. If your inner loop is going along rows, right? this is a bad ordering right the inner loop iterating on the rows means that on every iteration through the inner loop the value of i is changing and i am accessing a strided element i am basically jumping ahead n steps ideally what i would like to do is i pick a row go through the entire row because that is cache friendly so if I can switch these two around, this would improve the performance of this loop. Okay, These kind of things can actually be verified by writing the code corresponding to it. You can actually find that there would be a difference in the performance. Of course, it is not easy to create an example for this. The reason being the cache memory used in modern processors is large enough that it is difficult to create a scenario where you would actually see these kind of differences. Okay. But when you write large programs and large, uh, you know, either signal processing or scientific computations, these kind of matters actually can become fairly common. Now, a word on dependencies, 
right? We need to understand this because it comes up both in the context of software as well as in hardware. So Vivado HLS has a very uh, strong usage of dependencies in order to do optimizations, okay? What we have on the left hand side over here, for example, I have A is equal to 5, immediately followed by B is equal to A, okay? This is a direct dependence. Right? Because if I try changing the order of the two instructions around, it will give me the wrong answer. Okay, that's one thing, it will give me the wrong answer. Okay. Uh, and not only that, A has to get its value, or rather B has to get the value only after A has actually been updated. I might be able to do constant propagation and so on, that's a different story. Right? But there is a true dependency between the value of A and the value of B over here. Contrast this with what you are seeing over here, right? This, so in other words, uh, yeah, effectively this is a true dependence. What we have on the right hand side on, uh, though is something else. I'm saying A is equal to B and then I'm saying B is equal to 5. In other words, I want to make sure that A gets the old value of B, okay? <coughs> this is not a true dependence. A does not care what the value of B is after the assignment, right? It only has to make sure that I don't end up using the wrong value, okay? This is a so-called write after read hazard, okay? Why? Because I am writing after the read has occurred over here, right? Now, interestingly enough, you might feel that both of them are the same. After all, I wanted to take the old value of B. I want to make sure of that before I update the value of B, right? But it turns out that you can actually do a certain kind of compiler transformation, which effectively says that, you know, don't update the value of B. Effectively, what you need to think of is when I assign B is equal to five over here, it effectively means that the old value of B is completely gone. I'm never using it again. Think of this as a new variable, call it B1 and use only B1 after this, okay? If I do that, the dependency is gone. A is equal to B can happen at any time. It will take only that old value of B. And anyway, I'm using B1 is equal to five and then using B1 from there onwards, it will give me the correct behavior, right? So this is essentially something called single assignment operation, right? Any variable can be assigned only once, okay? Now, for those of us who are used to programming with languages like C and Java, this is actually a bit counterintuitive. It is the exact opposite of what we are trained to do, right? What we normally think is, okay, declare a variable to hold a value, keep on updating the value of that variable, use it whichever way you want and so on. What single assignment says is, no, if you a variable is a placeholder, but once you assign a value to it, it cannot change. So the way that it's normally referred to is something called static single assignment, meaning that once it's assigned, it cannot change, right? It turns out that there are actually languages that make use of this kind of approach, right? They usually the so-called functional programming languages actually impose this as a constraint. They have a requirement that you cannot update the value of a variable, okay? It does make certain kinds of computations harder to do, or at least harder to write the program, not harder to do for the compiler. But the benefits are actually quite significant. So what happens very often is that the compilers do this automatically. They go through the values of variables, and the moment that you have updated assignments to variables, they rename them. Okay, so you can convert it into something called a static single assignment form. The moment that you have static single assignment, all these kind of write after read hazards are gone. You do not have a problem that I might read the wrong value because I am updating it. I cannot update a variable. Okay. So long and short of it is both of these are dependencies as far as the program is concerned, the way that you have written the code. They, you, you cannot switch the order of the instructions around, but the one on the right can be fixed by 
changing the way that the program is written okay the same thing happens inside this loop what we are doing over here is in both cases in the first case i have b of i is equal to b of i minus 1 right i need to make sure that i actually update i minus 1 and you know in the next iteration it is then going to update that into i so b of 0 will get copied into b of 1 then into b of 2 then into b of 3 and so on whereas the right hand side is sort of doing the opposite this is like the shift register right it is i could in principle do all of these updates in parallel whereas over here this has to be done sequentially but this can be parallelized okay provided that i read all the old values of b and update them into the new values of b at one shot which if you think about it is exactly what a shift register would do in hardware okay which one no no that is because in this case it is just b of 0 is being written into every array what if it is a computation so b of i is equal to some f of b of i minus 1 well okay it is still a constant so yeah this is a trivial case it's just an assignment where we have this uh, so my point is that you know it need not always be just an assignment into b of i it can be something that is making use of the value of b of i minus 1 and doing a computation which could change okay in other words uh, yeah what you raised is a good point in the, uh, the way that i've given the example at least it looks as though i can just take b of 0 and propagate it to everything you can construct more complex examples especially once you bring in multiple variables over here where i have some a of i, a, my, I minus 1 being assigned that is being used for b of i right so then i can have a slightly more complex dependency sitting over here which is not quite easy to just get rid of by the compiler but still has to be done sequentially because of the nature of the index variable A related term right is something called a loop carried dependency right which basically says let's look at this kind of in fact yeah so this is an example of what we have over here i'm assigning b of i is equal to 8 and then i have a of i is equal to b of i minus 1 plus 10 okay i am trying to use what was there in the previous iteration of the loop right effectively what it means is that the way that the code is written out right now I cannot compute a of 1 until b of 0 has got a value. I cannot compute a of 2 until b of 1 has got a value. Okay, So there is a dependency that has been imposed by the loop. The way that I have written the loop, there is a proper dependency that is there from b1 to a2, b2 to a3 and so on. Okay, And I am updating the value of b of i right inside the loop over here it will be used by a in the next iteration of the loop okay so this in other words there is a dependency assigned in i used in okay uh, let me just change that assigned in let's say k and used in k plus 1 what I mean by that is if I look at iteration number k, b of k would have got a value. That b of k would be used in iteration k plus 1 for doing the update of a of k plus 1. Okay, So there is a true dependency over here between these two assignments. Whereas over here what I have is this is actually a loop independent dependency. I have b of i assigned over here, same b of i used over here. So there is no dependency between one iteration of the loop to the next. Right? So this right hand side, all the iterations can in principle be run in parallel. Left hand side cannot. Okay, And this loop carried dependency is something that you will actually come across quite often when you are trying to do synthesis using Vivado HLS. It looks at loops, it fi finds out that there is some issue with how the variables are being assigned and how arrays are being accessed. It will point out that it cannot do a parallel implementation of this or you know it's not able to schedule it within the time that you wanted it to. 
the last two transformations are especially important once we start looking at hardware right one of them is called unrolling the basic idea behind unrolling is very simple what it's saying over here is there is a significant loop overhead associated with this loop can i amortize that overhead can i split it across multiple computations okay so what happens over here is i have basically split it across five addition operations okay again keep in mind this is a trivial example that i'm using just to illustrate the idea but the core concept remains the same we have a certain overhead associated with the loop i would like to split that out amortize that effect okay so what happens over here is now the overhead the the unrolling step itself is done by modifying the loop uh the way the induction variable is set up how it is incremented and what the comparison is being done okay now you will probably notice that i tried unrolling by a factor of 5 okay it worked what if i wanted to unroll by a factor of 6 why is that complicated because i need to do it 100 times okay but if i do unroll 6 and i change this over here what will happen is it will go up to 96 and those last four 97 98 99 or rather 96 97 98 99 will not get executed it will not add that many times okay if i need to do that i will need a something called the epilog right which basically says 100 modulo 6 is equal to 4 sum plus equal to 10 4 times whatever is that remainder the last part of the loop needs to actually be done separately okay so unrolling can be done on almost any loop i mean in principle you can unroll you can take any for loop that you have and unroll it what does it mean it just means that instead of writing for i is equal to 0 to 100 you write the same code 100 times so fundamentally there is absolutely nothing preventing that from happening will you get benefit from it that is not very obvious you may or you may not okay but if you are unrolling by a partial factor if you are doing complete unrolling that is you just take that and write it out 100 times that's easy to do but if you are doing partial unrolling it turns out that 5 is perfectly okay for this particular loop 6 is not 6 you have to handle with care you first change the loop in order to do the groups of 6 and then you have to take care of that remainder at the end separately so you have to have a epilog okay now i showed you the case where this unrolling is used for sort of reducing the overhead of the loop but it turns out that exactly the same thing in the context of hardware can be used for parallelism right because what i can do is i can effectively say now i have these unrolled by 5 5 different things that need to be done can i do those in parallel now the way that i've written the code what i'm doing is i'm adding the same value to I, or I, or i'm adding something to the same variable so this effectively becomes a dependency right the fact that i am updating the value of sum but let's say that i had something slightly different which basically said for a of i is equal to some function of b of i okay and i rewrote this to look like for a of i equals some function of b of i and a of i plus 1 equals function of b of i plus 1 right and i do i is equal to i plus 2 in the loop right this is perfectly valid now in principle these two could run in parallel and i can create two separate pieces of hardware that do those things in parallel so unrolling in other words is a very simple way of getting parallelism into your program implementation right the trivial way of course is complete unrolling 
partial unrolling with a given factor can also be done so that you have control about how much hardware it uses. Because for example, if your loop is running 100 times, you don't always want to unroll it by a factor of 100. So if you can choose how much the unrolling is going to be done, that is better. Okay. So yeah, the unrolling for parallelism can be done in exactly the same way. You can do this, right? If I had a loop that was doing this, I could have split it out into two loops or rather the same loop, but two separate steps in which case A of I update and A of I plus one update can be done in parallel. The last topic is something called software pipelining. I may not be able to complete all of this today. We'll be finishing this tomorrow and then looking at Vivado HLS for the FFT as well as one more example uh, in tomorrow's class. Okay. The idea behind software pipelining is sort of extending the, I mean, it's basically saying, what if I had a set of instructions that could potentially be run one after the other, but I have certain kinds of constraints on them, the way that they stand, right? Let's take a quick look at this. I. I'm assuming that I have a for loop out here with A, B, C, D, E, F as separate function calls, each of which has a latency as specified over here, right? Some number of cycles. This is completely fictitious, but you know, this is an example from Wikipedia, but it illustrates the example quite well, uh, illustrates the concept quite well. What is important is that I have a set of dependencies. In other words, I'm going to assume that I need to do things in this order. Only after A of I has completed, I can do B of I, then I can do C of I, etc. Okay, so this order is important. What that effectively means is that my data flow graph for this system looks something like this. A, B, right? There are six operations that need to go in order. Now the normal schedule, right? The basic schedule that you can come up with would basically say this takes three cycles, this takes three, this takes 12, again, three, three, and three. If I schedule all of this out, what would I get the latency to be? Three plus three plus 12 plus three plus three plus three. That is 27 cycles. What about the initiation interval? Once again, 27 cycles because, you know, I have to finish all of them before I can go on to the next one. Okay. So now the idea of software pipelining, which is also called task level pipelining and in the context of HLS will actually be known as data flow pipelining, right? actually says that if I had separate pieces of hardware for A, B, C, etc., how would I go about doing this? How can I actually implement this? But let me consider another example to show that this can actually be applicable even in the context of software itself and is in fact used like this in many kinds of processors, for example, the TI uh, DSP pro uh, DSPs. Right? They can actually make use of this kind of software pipelining. What is happening over here is what we are saying is once A1 executes, next two clock cycles are idle, then B1 executes, then two clock cycles are idle, C1 executes, 11 cycles are idle. Now idle meaning that no other function or no other instruction can start there, then D1, E1 and F1. This is the exact operation that is happening. Okay. Question is, can something execute here or here or in any of these gaps? Okay. And what we are going to say is, okay, I mean, clearly A2 can. From a dependency point of view, it is possible for A2 to start in the next clock cycle, right? It is not waiting for anything. And we are going to assume that the processor is such that it is also a pipeline processor. It can potentially start this in the next stage, right? So what is actually happening over here? Effectively, what we are saying is we were, you know, the scenario that I'm constructing is slightly artificial. So you don't think of it too much in terms of can one function execute while the other one is going on or can one instruction execute while the other one is going on. The 
assumption is that you have hardware which enables that and under those conditions what can you do with it <coughs> okay so if i said for example that after a1 a2 can start and in the next clock cycle which is also id a3 can start next clock cycle a4 could start or b1 can start okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start b1 right then b2 and b3 then i'll have c1 c2 and c3 unfortunately that's it i can't run c4 okay i could run a4 but that complicates matters a little bit right i'm not really interested in going down that line so what i'll do is i'll instead keep this idle for the next nine cycles and then say from here onwards i can run d1 d2 d3 e1 e2 e3 f1 f2 f3 and from this point onwards this is the end i can start a4 a5 a6 etc so this now becomes the block <coughs> schedule right it has a latency again the same 27 cycles but the ii is now interesting the average is the only thing that you can really meaningfully talk about okay it's 27 by 3 so every 9 cycles i can essentially in initiate a new call to that set of functions a to f okay so the question is is this the best that can be done effectively if you think about it this is sort of like unrolling right what i have done over here is i have written out a1 a2 a3 b1 b2 b3 c1 c2 c3 and then the processor can straight away say okay a1 next clock cycle i can immediately start a2 because it has no other dependencies then a3 then b1 b2 b3 and so on so the unrolling will give you this and will allow you to bring down your initiation interval from 27 down to an average of 9 okay the question is can we do better okay so what we are going to do tomorrow is to look at how we can rewrite this code in such a way that these dependencies could be shifted around a little bit and give us an initiation interval of 6 okay which in this case is the best possible because you have six steps that are there inside the for loop so you can't really look for an initiation interval less than 6 right the same concept can then be applied to entire function level in hardware and we will take that and we will look at that in the context of the fft code and see how that can be used to bring down the latency okay all right stop here for now